And so writing just has that, that effect. And so when you're writing a tutorial, a tweet, a blog post, or even a readme file, if you box out your users with really difficult language or, or indirect writing, then they're not going to want to stick around. Or not likely going to want to stick around, that is. And they might be afraid to use your tool or your API or, or continue reading whatever you're working on. And so for me, clear writing is welcoming. It's using plain language and active voice to make sure your audience can follow along. But clear writing is also really hard sometimes. And I'm hoping that with this talk, I can help make it less difficult for you. Um, and I also want to do a full disclaimer that I make mistakes all the time. And I'm going to make a lot of mistakes probably during this presentation. But um, the, the point is to embrace your mistakes, because it's really hard to learn that you make your, your, when you're writing that it's hard to know if you're writing well unless you've made mistakes. And as I go through my presentation, if you are a fender of any of my tips, that's OK. And I don't want you to sit there and feel uncomfortable. It's totally OK. These are just some tips along the way, and I hope that help you take away some things. But um, a few things also is that this talk will assume that you already know your audience and your subject, which are talks on their complete own. So um, this is just getting right into clear writing and uh, more for the instructional, instructional point of view, but you can use it anywhere. All right. So let's begin with my writing checklist. Step one, explain that it's easy. Oh, man, what happened? My checklist utilized plain language. That's weird. Have it written in active voice. What is going on? I don't even know what a peer review is. Oh, man, maybe I did this for educational purposes. <laughs> All right, so let's go through each of these items and see how we can fix them. So the first one, explain that it's easy. Personally, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that you should explain it directly. And here's an example. So you can easily add Mapbox.js to your page just by adding the JS and CSS in the head, right? OK. Hmm. Let's think about that. Who exactly is this easy for? And you just want me to put what and where? Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a difficult thing to digest there for everyone. And sometimes you'll want to say something is easy to reassure the user. But if it's not easy to them, then you're just going to make them feel kind of inadequate or stupid sometimes. So let's take that sentence and take out some of those words. OK. You can add Mapbox.js by copying the following lines into the head of your page. There's the code. There it is. OK. So your job is not to tell someone that you don't even know that what you know is easy. right? Instead, your job is to explain it in the way to make them feel confident to be able to do something. And then hopefully they'll say it's easy once you've done that. And here are a few more words that I recommend avoiding. Um, easy, simple, just, basically, and obviously. So these words aren't necessarily bad um, or wrong. For, for me personally, I think it's more of a tone thing. Like, just do this. Just put something here. Basically, this idea, obviously, um, it can really change the, the way someone perceives your text. And it can be, it can be a huge turnoff. Um, and, but it's all about context, right? So some of these words might actually help your sentence. For instance, a couple weeks ago, my car battery completely died. And so I had it towed, because um, I wasn't sure if it was just the battery or it was the starter, too. And mechanic calls me back and says, don't worry, it was just the car battery. Your starter is fine. I did not mind that he said just in that sentence. I was like, thank you for saying just. It's just the car battery. Thank goodness. But you know, in other contexts, the word just can be really alienating. Um, my big tip for figuring out, like, do I need this word, is write your sentence, pluck out a word, read the sentence. Is it still strong? Then you didn't need that word. If it's not, throw it back in. 
But again, it's all about context. And there's a link um, from CSS Tricks about words to avoid in educational writing and has a bunch more and some more examples that I think are really swell. Okay, next tip. Tip number two. Utilize plain language. Well, how about we just use plain language instead? <laughs> okay, much better. All right, oh, so let's try an exercise. Okay, let's, let's try a breathing exercise. I am going to give you an instruction. And you're welcome to close your eyes, pretend you're at a spa or some yoga, I don't know, something relaxing that you enjoy. Um, okay, ready? As you inhale, activate your diaphragm, the muscle located horizontally between the chest cavity and stomach cavity by contracting it. How are we doing? Good? Are we breathing out there? Okay, there's got to be an easier way to say that. But, you know, we did learn a lot about the diaphragm there and, like, where it's located. But <laughs> what, well, I'm trying to get you to breathe, right? So how about I just tell you to breathe with your stomach, right? relaxing. It's really, really great. So with this instruction, oh, the, the previous instruction, the, the long-winded instruction where I was trying to tell you to breathe, it was more accurate, right? We told exactly what muscle that you need to activate in order to, be, to embrace the deep breathing. Um, and you, we learned so much about it. And so it was technically that one was correct. But this one, so much, so, just so much more simple. It's just simple, right? And I got you to do what I wanted you to do in less words, and you probably didn't have to think about it. And that's kind of what plain language is all about. It's making something relatable, and then in turn, that makes it more memorable. And we're using common words as a benefit. So we swapped out the word diaphragm, which not, maybe not everyone knows what the the muscle, the diaphragm is or where it's located, but everyone, I'm pretty sure I can assume everyone knows what the stomach is, right? So we found a common word and we were able to explain it in a different way by making it relatable. And we can also make, and a lot of the times, plain language can make your text more concise. Because when you're trying to boil down really difficult topics and you're, you have to also think about how I'm gonna say that in plain language, you have to think about your goals. You know, you don't have a lot of room to throw an extra flowery language. You have to think about your goals. And so if I wanted you to learn more about the diaphragm and everything that goes on in deep breathing, I could have just linked to it, right? And I could let you go off on your own adventure. And more importantly, don't make them reach for the dictionary, especially, especially, in, especially in instructions, right? They're already trying to learn something that might be completely new to them, and making them reach for the dictionary or look up hard words is just, is just so jarring. It's just another step in the wrong direction. And it, it can be really fun when you start writing because you have so many words out there, and you want to you know, you really practice. You want to you know, use that flowery language. But for instructions, using common words is a benefit. And there, there are times you're definitely going to be using jargon, right? You're definitely going to be using abbreviations. And how we do at Mapbox is we actually have a glossary of all of our terms in our guides. And whenever we, ha we come across one of those words, we'll link to the glossary item. So there are ways around um, linking, just create, making that uh, word a link to somewhere else. Let them go off on their own adventure so you don't have to distract them. Or anytime you have an abbreviation, make sure you Say it out full in parentheses, the abbreviation. It's kind of like introducing two friends, right? You say who they are, what they do, that now they've met. You don't have to do that every single time you talk, talk about them. Okay. And so here, is a, here are a few more. Instead of this, try this. So as I said before, um, utilize is such a heavy word. And I, I see it a lot in writing. But use, the word use is, is usually a lot a lot kinder. It doesn't sound as so like harsh. And oftentimes, in order to, you can just be replaced by two. And start is often a better alternative to implement. And I found these, and there's a whole ton of resources at plainlanguage.gov. I highly recommend it. They have lots of resources on how you can um, change any of your texts or any tips for learning plain language. Okay, let's see. 
Step number three, have it written in active voice. Okay, which in itself is not even in active voice, so let's write in active voice. Much better, much better. Okay, so here is an example. After the file is downloaded. Who is downloading the file and, okay, then am I supposed to download the file or um, is, should I, did I miss a step? Should I go back and see who should be downloading this file? That's the problem with passive voice. So let's take that and put it into active voice. After you download the file, oh, magic. I know that now that action is entirely on me. I must be the downloader of this file. So that is active voice in action. With active voice, there's no question as to who's doing what. It's, it's, it's so direct and it's clear. And it also holds people accountable. So there are, there are cases when passive voice stylistically is better, um, can, can be better, um, especially great when you don't want to hold anyone accountable. So I guess it depends on, of course, what you're writing about. But for instruction, you almost always want to use active voice. And active voice can also make your text more relatable. When you think about it, humans, we, we, we relate to other humans, right? So when we put an I or a you or a pronoun in front of that verb, we see that, oh, this person is able to do this, then I can do it too. So it's a really nice relationship you're building there. And you also don't have to think about it too much. And ultimately, if the user has to do something, just tell them. That's most important. And um, if you ever need help about writing instructions, I highly recommend opening up a recipe book um, because all of the, it's all very direct. I mean, they don't use pronouns. They say, you know, like preheat the oven to 350 degrees. And it's amazing because we know, we know that that oven is not going to preheat itself, you know. So we know that we have to do that. And it's, recipes have very clear and direct instructions. Um, especially good ones, especially ones that have pictures, but I digress. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fourth tip, organize content with paragraphs. Okay. Kind of seems obvious, but how else can we do that? How about we organize content with lists and tables and headlines? Let me show you what I mean. Here's an example on the left of a big block, a big old paragraph, and on the right is after we broke it out into steps. Do you see a huge difference there? For in the after, because it's in, it's, in, it's in ordinal steps, the user is automatically, okay, this is my action time. I see that it's in one, two, three, four, these are steps I need to take, and it's so much clearer to digest visually. The text is any other different, it doesn't change between the two other than one's in a list and one's in a paragraph. Okay, and how about using tables? Here's a before and an after. Same content, one just uses a table instead. And visually, the table allows us to quickly find information much, much, much quicker than it is in that big old paragraph. And it helps us also draw comparisons. So using tables and lists isn't just about, it's about organizing, but being able to let, allow your users to find the information easier. And also using headlines. So on the left, we have uh, a text without any headlines. And on the right, we do have headlines. And you can just tell in a split second where, where you can start initializing the map on the right. But on the left, you're going to have to dig a little bit. Headlines are my, my favorite trick to just making, to be, to making text more digestible. Because you have to chunk them into sections. You have to create that organization of using headlines. And when you're doing that, it helps you organize your thoughts, but also helps the reader, especially that reader who's just looking for something in particular. I'm sure we've all, want, we've all done this. You know, we're just looking to find X, and so we, we Google it, we find a big blog post, and we're like, we don't have time for this blog post, and so you start scrolling, right? And maybe you, can, you command F, you try to search, but with headlines, it makes it so much easier to be able to skim something. It puts everything into context, and you'll be able to find things much quick, much more quickly. Okay. And for my fifth tip, 
it's to uh, get not a pair review, but a peer review, right? Much better. Okay. Here is an example of a sentence that I wrote a few weeks ago. I'll let you read that. Yeah, so I write these sentences all the time. It's when you're, you're writing and you're writing and you're writing, you're changing things, and all of a sudden you have words that make no sense. Maybe they made sense before, but now you have a sentence with extra words and it's just completely awkward. And like, I swear, I swear, I proofread this. I proofread it like so many times. But it's an amazing thing when you're looking at your own text is that everything just looks the same and your eyes just get so weary. And so, so, we, so I got a proofread and <laughs> Magically, that word is gone. And so at Mapbox, we make it a point to have at least another set, another set of eyes on anything that we push live. And there's a lot of reasons why that's a great thing. Number one, obviously, is making sure our writing makes sense and we don't have extra words in there. And number two, we're, you know, we're also getting great opinions, right? And we're also learning different um, other people's writing styles, which is also important. And it's making us all strong writers as we're all contributing and we're all working together. And um, let's see. So one of my, my, my biggest tips about peer reviews is to let these, the, small, the small things like extra words, spell, using the wrong form of their or your, let, let those things, edit those things quietly but discuss the concepts openly. Um, because we're, I'm sure we, we're all at the stage where we know that these simple mistakes were, you know, were simple and they hurt, so they still hurt. And they're so easy to make, especially when you're writing in like a text editor, which isn't really as, as easy to, to write you know, languages, uh, write, um, write copy as something like, word, like a word editor. Um, so it's so easy to make these mistakes. So let the small things fly, you know, edit those quietly, you know, but discuss the bigger concepts a little more loudly. And, well, okay, so what happens if you don't have any peers around you? Well, you can grab one of these fancy computer reviewers. These are two of my favorite tools, nitpickertool.com and hemingwayapp.com. Nitpicker tool is really, really slick. So you can copy your, you copy your text and you paste it in hit analyze, and it's gonna read through your text. What I really like about Nitpicker tool is it'll choose words that are, you know, that are maybe suspect, and it'll, it'll provide you with alternatives. For instance, I use the word, I use might a lot in my, in my writing, and actually I should be writing using may, unless it was something that you must do. So it, it gives you those kind of comparisons, and it's really helpful um, about catching things that maybe you forgot about in grammar school. Um, and Hemingway app is very similar. It's another copy and paste and analyze. What I like about Hemingway app is it'll check for um, active and passive voice. It'll also, it'll also um, make sure you're not using too many adverbs or it'll also check sentences to see if they're too difficult. Um, and it can be kind of hard if you're using a lot of technical terms that the computer might not recognize. Um, so it throws a few false positives, but it'll also give you um, a grade reading level, which is also kind of helpful, too. Okay, great. All right, and so here's the writing checklist all complete. You're going to explain it directly, use plain language, write in active voice, organize content with lists, tables, and headlines, and then get a peer review, not a pair review. Great, all right. So, this list can help improve your writing, and maybe not all items will apply to your writing, but I think it can. Um, and the thing about this is that we're not just writing, um, we're not just writing to tell people about things, we are writing to build a community. We're writing to build relationships with our users. And if we're unable to communicate with them directly and effectively, and we box them out, then they're not gonna wanna come back, and we're not gonna have that relationship. So that's why, for me, uh, writing clearly is so important, especially in open source. And one other thing that I, I think about a lot is that I'm really hoping that, you know, what if I wrote a guide, and that was 
and someone read it and wanted to go through it, and that's how they learned JavaScript for the first time. You know, wouldn't it be so great if one of our tools was a reason someone wanted to learn something they never thought they could learn before? And because we were clear and we were honest with our writing and we were very direct that they were able to do that. So that is why I am a huge advocate for clear writing. Um, thanks for listening. Um, I'd love to know how you are writing. Um, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. My slides are up there too. They're on GitHub. Uh, I ran a little quickly from excitement. Uh, <laughs> but that is all I have for you today. And um, instead of asking questions, I would love to hear of any of your favorite tools that you use when writing, or any of your like tricks to share with the group if you have any. Yeah. Um, I love to drive the Hemingway app. That's one of my favorite things. Um, I also love the book Bunk and Bite. It's a play on the Drunk and White Guide to Writing. It's a really great thing for people who are writing specifically copy. Oh, that's uh, great. Kind of steal this book by everybody. Great, great. It's it's Spunk. Spunk and bite. Thanks. I'll have to remember that one. Sure. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, Lizzie. If you are editing for, not for content, but for grammar or spelling or um, read the, read it backwards, whatever you wrote. So start with the last sentence and then go backwards because you won't get caught up in the flow, but you'll just look at sentence by sentence to see if you made any typos or mistakes. That's a very good one. I don't know if everyone heard that, but reading your copy backwards. Because then you can really focus on each sentence, make sure each so sentence is strong. It's a really good one. Yeah. I'm a big fan of things that are prepositional phrases and turning them into adjectives if you can. It's important to have a few more of those functions. That's a really good one, too. Yeah. <laughs> what is it called? Yeah, I actually threw up a couple. I'll have to throw that one up too. And I, 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 I've been recently reading uh, Writing Tools, um, 50 Essential Strategies for Every Writer. I didn't put the author, I'm sorry. And also, Woe is I is also a good one. I'll have to put the new Oxfords, you said? Yeah. 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 Great. And, and Spunk and Bite. Awesome. Oh, you in the back? That's great. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Um. Um, well, it's not really a way to learn to write simply, but the, I really like the idea of a simple English Wikipedia. So it's like Wikipedia, but in other languages, but you can get every Wikipedia article written in a very basic um, language, which is great for, for people who write in English. That's very good. Google for a simple English Wikipedia. And I had no idea that existed. That's so cool. Anyone else? Uh, yes? I, li I really like to just read out loud. Like, go back over whatever I've written and read out loud and make sure that it's, you know, it's simple enough to speak. Yeah, sometimes some something like you read in your head does not sound totally different when you actually say it aloud. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Anyone else? Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>